Hello and welcome to this deep dive conversation. In one of his last acts as the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights, Neil Musniex warned against the resurgent threats to women's rights and gender equality across Europe. Populists, social conservatives and family rights movements throughout the West appear to have made the sexual and reproductive health rights of women a key battleground in the cultural wars of the 21st century. With me today to discuss the situation and to assess what this means for women is Neil Data. Neil is the founder of the Brussels-based European Parliamentary Forum. Neil is well placed to discuss the attempts to roll back women's rights as the EPF is a network of parliamentarians from across Europe who are committed to championing women's sexual and reproductive health rights. Neil Data, welcome to this Deep Dive podcast. Thank you. Neil, what was happening in 2000 that made you want to start the European Parliamentary Forum? Well, um, back in the year 2000, um, uh, there was a lot of work being done to implement what was, what, uh, was then known as the, um, the ICPD Programme of Action. So that's the Programme of Action on, um, on Population and Development adopted in 1994. And there's a regular process at the United Nations to review pr uh, how countries are implementing that program of action, which provide for greater sexual and reproductive health and rights for citizens around the world. And we had noticed that there were parliamentary movements organized to implement that program of action in all other regions of the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and Asia. But there was nothing here in Europe. And so in 1999-2000, a group of MPs uh, came together and thought we need to get our act together and then decided to found EPF, the European Parliamentary Forum on Population and Development. And since then, we've, uh, we started out very small and since then we've grown and, uh, and now we're a healthy organization uh, uh, 18 years later. Neil, I'm, I've got to say it. Does it matter that you're a man who founded this organization to advocate in favor of women's sexual and reproductive rights? I don't know if it matters or not, but I mean, it, it is true that uh, as a man working in this field, um, my former boss, uh, who was a woman, uh, said that men in this field are like pandas. They're a very endangered species that need to be protected. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, okay, so clearly you've chosen since 2000, I know you've been secretary of this organization since 2004, Neil. You've chosen to focus on sexual and reproductive health rights. I should also say this is not just in Europe, it's across the world. Yeah. Um, you will know, because I'm sure you look at the internet as I do, that the this issue of abortion rights and family planning has been demonized or is demonized across the West and beyond. So why have you chosen to focus on this issue? You could have chosen, for example, to focus on education rights. Many people say that that's the key to the uplift of women ac across the world. Uh, well, I mean, sexual and reproductive health and rights are, are a... Or a are a vital concern for every individual in the world. I mean, behind this complicated jargon of sexual and reproductive health and rights, it's basically questions about who do you, who do you love, who will you found a family with, uh, how will you have children, and um, uh, how, will you, how will you organize your own personal intimate life. And all of that depends on a certain number of rights uh, that politicians can make or, or or can grant or not grant that allows you to make these decisions. So it's it's core to every individual in the world, and um, it's also uh, something that each politician has to take into account at some point. So it's it's uh, so it's because it's so vital that we uh, uh, that we focus on this. So I noticed on your website that you are linked, uh, Neil, to the International Planned Parenthood Federation. They were involved in the setting up of your organisation. You'll be aware that this organization has come in for a lot of criticism, particularly in the United States. Why do you think that is? Uh, IPPF has come in for a lot of criticism, that's true, in the United States, mainly because the, uh, the debate in the United States around the issue of women's rights, and specifically abortion, but not just abortion, also access to contraception, uh, sexuality education, a whole range of other things um, related to human sexuality, has become so politicized um, and that those who are politicizing this uh, this issue are also targeting the main protagonists in this uh, uh, working in this area. So they're targeting Planned Parenthood and, and via that the 
International Planned Parenthood Federation, also the UN Population Fund, the, the equivalent at the UN level, and also similar organizations um, working on, on human rights uh, related to sexuality. So it's become controversial because of the of the debate in the U in the United States, in part uh, around Roe v. Wade, and uh, which has become which is resurfacing now uh, with uh, the discussions around the uh, the possible nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. That uh, politicization of the issue of abortion rights in particular, we're beginning to see echoes of that in Europe. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the program, uh, Neil, Neil Musniex, in his detailed report, he warned against this rollback of women's rights. That the, He said clearly and starkly that women's rights are under threat. You've probably seen that report. You're involved in this work. What are the most glaring examples of this backlash, Neil? Well, first, I, I mean, it's great that the that the commissioner came out with this report because it really is it provides an authoritative basis for uh, understanding women's rights and sexual reproductive health and rights. It's really very thorough and authoritative. Um, the the backlash for women's rights um, we should not underestimate it. Um, abortion has always been controversial, and here in Europe we had assumed that a compromise had been made when we had uh, legislated on the issue of abortion, usually in the late 60s and uh, 1970s, and we thought that that compromise was there, it's done, it's not perfect, but at least it allows everyone some way of going on with life. Right now that compromise is being reopened by socially conservative actors who want to restrict uh, women's right to abortion and a whole range of other related uh, rights in matters of sexuality. So right now there's a resurgence, a new movement that is based on reopening up that consensus and rolling back on abortion rights. And it is not just abortion rights. This movement is equally active on so-called family rights or the traditional family. It's a movement that basically only um, uh, would only authorize human sexuality if the end is for procreation. Any other means of human sexuality would be, uh, would be forbidden or would be uh, illegal or, or prescribed in some way. So this means family planning and abortion because that does not lead to procreation as well as uh, LGBT uh, relations and marriage because that does not lead to procreation either. And so that's why you see a rollback of abortion rights uh, or attempts to roll back on abortion rights in Poland, in Spain in recent years, and you equally see attempts to restrict equal marriage for same-sex couples in Croatia, Slovakia, Romania. It's part, and part, it's part of the same uh, initiatives. You've identified where you think the problems are, but I think in the interest of fairness, it's important to establish what you stand for. So what, uh, in a nutshell, if that's possible, what is the program of the EPF? We believe that women, and in fact all individuals, should have a right to make informed choices related to their own bodies. It's as simple as that. You also talked in in one of your answers about the politicization of abortion rights in the United States. That alone cannot explain why this issue has come back 30 years or so, 30, 40 years after the great bargain, let's say, this compromise, as you mentioned. So what is the origins of this backlash? Is it just, as I mentioned, this kind of importation of a kind of cultural war mindset that we've seen in the United States since the mid 80s? Or is there something else going on in the in European society that might explain why the issue of gender equality and uh, abortion rights or as you say sexual and reproductive health rights should be uh, now a subject in question while there is an american connection it is not purely an american import we have a proper a fully European anti-human rights movement uh, when it concerns uh, human sexuality, which is our own and of our own creation. And there are several different contributions to this. So one, we've always had one here in Europe, so that as soon as abortion was legislated in the 1970s, very shortly after you saw the, the so-called pro-life movement, the anti-abortion movement, appear organized and offer an alternative to, uh, to the legislations that were passed. So that's always been there. But over the past five, six years now, we've seen that there's perhaps a second generation of these organizations that have appeared. And whereas before they were rather amateurish, mom and pop organizations uh, uh, that had been organized, what we see now is that this new generation are professional trained lobbyists 
who are running around the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, uh, as well as any other trained lobbyists. They're multilingual, they're, they're, uh, they're young, they're trained in politics and in uh, uh, with legal studies, they have law degrees, and they're engaging in modern political and uh, lit modern political advocacy and increasingly litigation. So there's a new generation there. This new generation, who are, where does it come from? One, there is a, uh, there is a U.S. component. The U.S., the Americans bring some money and also litigation experience. Uh, in the United States, advance, social advances were done mainly through the courts. Roe v. Wade, equal marriage, contraception, even way back. That was through the courts, not through legislation. But so they're bringing this litigation experience to Europe, and uh, and they will start experimenting this. There's already a case before the European Court of Human Rights brought by one of these American uh, organizations about a Swedish midwife who says she is Christian, and because of that does not wish to perform abortion, but Swedish legislation does not allow for conscientious objection in the field of midwifery. So there's a case there uh, that's being argued, and this is part of this new generation. Second component um, is also, uh, comes from the Vatican. In the late 1990s, the, uh, the Vatican had, uh, had, um, uh, had encountered a number of very important defeats. One was, then, was in 1994 at this Cairo conference on ICPD, on population and development, which recognized uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. A second defeat was in 1995 at, um, at the, the Beijing conference on, uh, on women. And after that, the Vatican, and especially Vatican thinkers in Europe and Latin America, were starting to think, how, why are we losing? What's happening? You know, the society is going to move on beyond a place that we can recognize and we don't feel comfortable with that. Shortly thereafter, in the early 2000s, they, con they conceptualized gender ideology. And so gender, gender ideology is this catch-all phrase where they can put in there any social innovation which is disturbing to the to the Holy See. So it concerns uh, gender equality, divorce, contraception, uh, abortion, sexuality education, and naturally, and even in some cases, for example here in Belgium, euthanasia. And so gender ideology is what's perverting societies. So now they have a, a narrative framework that they have conceived of that they can use uh, to describe the what's happening uh, around the world that they don't like. That's, so this Vatican conceptualization of gender, gender ideology is the second one. The third component is uh, the geopolitics and that coming from the Russian uh, uh, Federation. So the Russian Federation was never very active on, um, on sexuality issues. Um, uh, back in the time of the USSR, um, abortion was used as a method of birth control. Um, so it was never really a, an important thing in, in, uh, uh, in that context. But maybe, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, a number of revolutions started happening in, happening in their neighboring countries, in Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, etc. And they didn't have a response for that. And these, these revolutions were seen as largely pro-Western and against Russian interests. Uh, so a number of thinkers within the Kremlin started to, to test the idea that Russia should become the champion of traditional values. And by traditional values is meant uh, the traditional family uh, and traditional family patriarchal, so man, woman, two children, everyone has their well-defined roles. Uh, uh, also, it's against uh, um, the extension of LGBT rights. So, tradition. So, Russia started to become the champion of this uh, tradition of these traditional values, and it became very useful for uh, people in for uh, political elites in in the Russian Federation. Um, traditional values gave them a narrative framework to fend off human rights criticisms from the West or from international organizations, so that if Council of Europe or some other body criticized the Russian Federation, you're not respecting human rights in this or that field, they would have a ready-made argument saying, but we are a traditional country, we don't need to conform to these types of uh, 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 obligations. Um, it was also useful domestically in that it served to preserve the status quo. So you have this emerging from the Russian Federation, and also the Russian Federation finding allies in other parts of the world with the American Christian right and with the uh, continental European actors who are also thinking this. So you have, right now, you have this convergence of these three different poles coming together, which put into question 
Abortion, but again, it's not just abortion. It's everything related to human sexuality and the traditions around this. Mm -hmm. So it's equally women's rights to contraception, abortion, as well as uh, um, uh, same-sex rights in, in equal marriage. Neil, you talk about the convergence of forces. I understand that these these groups are well connected, but have they managed to get electoral traction, political traction, or are we discussing movements which may well be very active in the media sphere, but haven't quite haven't translated that media success into political success? Because there is a sense that Europe is becoming more liberal. So, uh, what's your assessment of 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 the political traction of the of these movements, these faith-based movements, these social conservatives and these populists in the European context? Well, I mean, these movements live as much in the 21st century as you and I, so they have the possibilities to organize transnationally as much as anyone else. And they have organized transnationally. And so how are these movements uh, gaining access to power? Um, we have seen that it, so it's not one clear picture everywhere and it depends very much on the different local opportunity structures in different co national contexts so that in some contexts they have been able to gain power or gain influence in some others they're slowly creeping up and in others they're not get they're not getting anywhere in some other contexts they they make a brief uh, brush at power then they lose it very quickly so that just some examples we know that for um, uh, and also they've been spending the past couple of years building up their own infrastructure so they started out uh, they started out fairly late they really organized maybe in 2012 2013 and then now they're reaping some of the rewards of their organization so that uh, where are they in power for example um, uh, Italy as a result of those of the recent elections, now the Lega Nord is in power, which has an openly uh, hostile agenda to women's rights and LGBT rights. The how did, did they end up in power? Well, that's a result of the domestic uh, Italian political context. Um, but now, uh, you know, the, there's a, a minister for families who's openly hostile to these issues, and also um, where the Lega Nord is rather friendly to uh, to the Russian Federation. We saw this in the first week of, uh, of uh, how it is that they came to power. In some other countries, we see that they are getting elected into parliament, uh, so that the IFD, the Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, they have over 90 MPs, so that's a first uh, success for them. With these 90 MPs, they will be able to build upon this uh, over the next uh, term of parliament so that they will be given, according to German law, they will be entitled to funding to organize as a party and also eventually to create a political foundation such as the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung or the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And so they will start producing ideas which are anti-women, anti-gender and of a hard right populist uh, approach. In some other countries, the approaches are more modest and in yet some others, um, for example, in France, they had made a big showing in 2013 with, with uh, La Manif pour tous, but then they had tried to, they've consolidated someone, but then the, it's just sort of fizzled out. We expect them to be gearing up between now and next year for the European elections. What's the strategy of these organizations? Are they always looking for an opportunity to revive this issue of, of their concerns around gender and sexuality? Are they, in a sense, opportunistic? Or do they have a very set agenda and they are just following through certain talking points uh, which are either discussed in the media or discussed in Parliament? Well, first, it's um, it, this is a new social movement that's, uh, that's emerging. And so as with any social movement, you have as an equal amount of cooperation as well as probably competition within a social movement, even when you're allied. So if you just think of any movement, uh, for example, a political party, even all the socialists or all the conservatives, they all share a common thing, but we know that there's different streams uh, co and internal competition rivalries within that. We can expect the same thing within this emerging socially conservative movement. So that's one thing. Where are they, at, where are they unified? It looks like their forward message is unified around a threefold approach. One is the defense of life, from and by life they mean from natural from the moment of conception until natural death. So they're against abortion, some forms of contraception, and then also euthanasia. The next one is they're in favor of the traditional family, so mother, father, two children, uh, traditional roles, and uh, etc. They're against sexuality education. They're against. Um, 
uh, uh, the, the role of schools in providing um, comprehensive sexuality education. And then thirdly, they're in favor of what they call religious liberty. Uh, religious liberty. So that sounds nice, but what they actually mean is the right to derogate from certain laws, especially hate speech or non-discrimination laws, on the basis of their personal religious affiliation. So that's where they're, that's where they're unified. And then we see also where they use certain common tactics and strategies. One of them is to demonize their opponents as being, for example, purveyors of gender ideology. Another one is to go for funding of their opponents. So that's why there have been campaigns to defund Planned Parenthood starting in the US, but also they've appeared here in Europe, in France, in Spain, uh, elsewhere. So go for the funding of their opponents uh, is another uh, aspect of it. And then also they, what they are trying to do is that they know that going against uh, frontally against abortion laws is unlikely to be successful. It failed in uh, Poland, it's failed in, uh, in Spain. What they're now trying to do is gnaw away at the right of women to access abortion by taking away certain small things here and there. So they will be advancing the right of conscientious objection uh, for uh, gynecologists. They'll be, prob they'll be pushing for delays in women accessing the abortion services. And so there is a, there's a fairly common playbook that they use, which they deploy at different moments when the time is right. Clearly, uh, these groups represent formidable opponents for you and other organizations which are working on behalf of, the, uh, of maintaining the sexual and reproductive health rights of women. Um, what strategic weaknesses do you see in these movements? They, they have a number of strategic weaknesses. One of them is that they know themselves that what they would actually want to do is completely unacceptable to a normal average European elector. Um, people may have some doubts about, uh, about abortion, but very few people actually want to reopen the debate around this issue. Um, people may not think on a daily basis about access to contraception, but the average European knows that he or she has access to contraception within, uh, that's fairly easy. Um, they would, uh, so th their real agenda, which would be to really only allow human sexuality for the purposes of procreation, that they know they cannot sell this in, to a European audience. So that's one thing. If we actually show what they are really about, then, you know, then they're unmasked. Second area of vulnerability is who are their allies? Many of them try to uh, go, through, go to great lengths to uh, appear reasonable, they're nice people, they're simply uh, following their Christian faith and uh, they, um, they would simply like people to listen to them. When you take a look at who are they connected to, you find ever deeper layers of far-right, populist, um, uh, rather disturbing categories of organizations and individuals. And so simply taking a look at how are they networked themselves, I mean, who you choose to be your friends tells a lot about your personality and what you're actually going for. So these are two very strong areas of vulnerability that they have. In saying that, do you see the potential for a grand alliance between Islamic groups, Jewish groups and Christian groups around this issue of the right to life? That's hard to say. It's In a way, it already exists at the, U, at the UN level, in that this grand alliance between socially conservative, faith-based uh, 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 communities does exist in what's called the Friends of the Family Caucus, uh, which is a group of countries organized to defend the traditional family at the level of the, uh, uh, the, level of the United, Nations, uh, United Nations. So that's, I mean, and there you find the Russian Federation, Belarus, alongside Qatar, some Central American countries, Iran. Uh, so you find the different, uh, as well as the Holy See. Uh, the Holy See is not officially or not visibly part of it, but it's involved in there. Um, so you see these that alliance there. In Europe, you don't see this alliance. Uh, uh, it's mainly different varieties of Christian actors. But among the Christian actors, you do see the different denominations coming together. So the biggest group of that are the, the ones closely associated with the Holy See. Um, and so that's simply because demographically the, the Catholics have been the most numerous in, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. But you see those very closely aligned with the, with the Holy See on thinking on social issues. Next to this are the traditionalist Protestants. So that in, even among the Protestant uh, faiths that have officially moved towards a more progressive uh, thinking, there are 
small communities of traditionalist Protestants, even within those communities that have remained, uh, that have not changed their ideas. Among uh, uh, you find those in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, uh, so, so and you find those aligning themselves with the uh, uh, Holy See led um, uh, Catholics. And then the third component are the different Orthodox churches, which are increasingly becoming more politically active and aligning themselves on social issues uh, on Vatican thinking, basically. Prim the primary one is the Russian Orthodox Church, but a lot of the Orthodox churches are themselves autocephalic. And so you see a more diversity there. So the Russians are the most, uh, are aligning themselves most actively on this. Some others not yet. In terms of your own campaign goals, Neil, are you reassured by the result of the Irish referendum on abortion? Yeah, I mean, the Irish, uh, the, yeah, the result of the Irish referendum was ve was a very nice, comforting surprise uh, that, uh, that came. Uh, a comforting surprise? You, yeah. you were one of those who thought it may well go the other way? No, um, I was expecting it to go to be in favour. I wasn't expecting it to be so loudly in favour. It got 66, 67 percent, which was a bit more than than uh, than than I was expecting. But um, or it could be that I I just didn't dare hope to expect uh, for such a, a clear outcome. Yeah, no, but you're right. I mean, uh, in um, and going back to an early point that you said, there's a there is a tendency uh, among uh, among many West European countries to go in a certain more progressive direction. So Ireland is one. Now we have the debate also starting in Northern Ireland, and uh, there's also and the other leftover uh, uh, bits of uh, the United Kingdom, such as the Isle of Man and Gibraltar. Those also there's something that started there as well. Um, and this is part of a trend also where um, France has also modernized its uh, abortion legislation uh, over the past few years. There's a current debate taking place in Belgium now going in the same direction, uh, although we're right in the middle of the debate, so it's a bit difficult to anticipate where it will go. Um, it's, being, it's appearing also in Germany, around the, they have an article of their penal code around advertising of, a, of abortion services, which is being called into question now. So there's that happening. And at the same time, it, during the same period, a lot of these countries also advanced on equal marriage issues. Uh, uh, Ireland is another example, but so is Malta, Germany, uh, um, uh, Austria. So there's that progressive uh, uh, tendency taking place. Although there's a there's a there's a, a, a counter tendency taking place and being advanced in some countries. From your vantage point, Neil, are you seeing similar legis legislative proposals being made in different countries? As though there is an organisation, there is a kind of planning of action around this issue, which is taking place in different countries. And there's a there's a what what's learned in one theatre may well be applied in another. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. And as I said, the social conservative organizations, they live as much in the 21st century as we do. This means that they, are tr they have the opportunity to organize transnationally, just like we do, and they do this. We know that they meet annually in a, in a meeting called the Agenda Europe uh, Summit, and that they exchange uh, information on what has worked well, what has not worked well, in the same way that any other social movement would uh, would meet. And so we know that they that they that they meet um, annually. They exchange information, and that provides for an opportunity for them to exchange notes on on good practices. So uh, one lesson that it's that it would appear that they've learned is that. That, uh, frontal attacks on abortion are are not likely to be successful. It's better to undermine abortion rights through incremental means, so that it didn't work in Spain, it didn't work in Poland, also it didn't work in Turkey when uh, the president uh, uh, spoke out against it. So they'll try other ways of doing things. So that, for example, in Spain, even though the the big um, the big uh, restriction of 2014 was not enacted. The result of that was a restriction for uh, minor for minors to access abortion without parental consent. Um, in Poland, the the full ban of 2016 was withdrawn, but what they are now considering is restricting abortion in the case of fetal anomaly. So, incremental is what they're moving towards right now. You were buoyed by the resounding success of the Irish referendum result. You would have noted the opinion polls which suggest, particularly amongst the young, there is an endorsement of uh, sexual and reproductive health rights on the part of women. Yet, I don't detect in anything that you've said so far in our conversation, Neil, any complacency. Why would that be? 
why are you not just sitting back saying that the, the, the force of history is with you in your arguments and that you can defeat intellectually any of the points put by these faith-based groups, these uh, socially conservative groups? Why are you not complacent about, about your, winning, your winning hand, so to speak? We're winning, but we're only beginning a new battle. So as I said, th this is a movement that's new. It's, um, it's been building up its own infrastructure for the past couple of years, and we haven't fully engaged in the battle. So that over the next couple of years, we can expect more cases to appear before the European courts, including the European Court of Human Rights. We need to gear up for that. Um, uh, we're, we may have the intellectual arguments on our side, but we may not have the the... Um, the infrastructure in place in order to fully wage this, to take on this battle. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that what we are saying is intellectually more accurate than the other side, but the other side has been uh, quite surprising in, uh, in how well it has organized over the past few years, and it would be foolish to be complacent in the light of a, of a battle that we know is coming. And whatever and, and if we have any doubts about what could come here, we need simply to look at the other side of the Atlantic to see how uh, this issue has been politicized, as well as on abortion, employer rights, equal marriage, and all of this, so that they've made gains, but now we see that how, they can, how quickly they, they can be eroded. What do you say to those observers, Neil, who acknowledge and respect women's sexual and reproductive health rights, but who also wish that fathers, who were, of course, partners in the making of the child, should also have a hearing for their points of view? You will have noticed the emergence of a men's rights movement as well, particularly it flourishes on the internet. How sensitive are you to some of the arguments made by men's rights advocates concerning this issue of the sexual and reproductive health rights of women? Well, I think it's good that men are interested in, in, in these issues. I mean, um, naturally, that's uh, that's a very welcome thing. Um, I think we just, uh, I, when it comes to abortion rights specifically, I think we just need to be lucid and clear in what we're talking about. It's happening to a woman's body, not to our body as men. It, it's as simple as that. I mean, and if they're concerned about a pregnancy and with their partner, or, or they need to address that through dialogue. Um, it's a it's an intimate issue between two two people who have who have a relationship, but it's not one where um, someone else can Im has rights over someone else's body. A woman has rights over her body, that's it. Uh, well, you see, they say that it isn't it, in fact. They would say that um, since there was consent in the making of the child, perhaps the relationship has uh, withered since, but the father may well want to discuss his rights to the survival of the unborn child. And that's why they are afraid that the the discussion around abortion rights is is located solely on the rights of the woman. I don't know if I'm making that point as eloquently as a men's right as a men's rights advocate would make it, but you're clearly familiar with that argument, Neil. So, how would you respond to it? Yeah, I, I think there's only so elegantly that point can be made. I think you've done a good enough job. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they can wish it all they want. At the same time, it's not happening to their body. That there's only a limit as to what they can as to what level of uh, opinion they can have on this. They can have opinions, they can say what they would like, but they, th it's not the same as having rights over someone else's body, and they need to recognize that. How powerful is your coalition, your the, the number of MPs who are part of your network, Neil? You've identified the well-resourced opponents that you face. You've identified the fact that they are benefiting from global forces. So in terms of, of uh, pushing back against that advocacy, what are you doing in your network to make other parliamentarians aware of, of, of the stakes of this issue? In terms of how well-organized are we, we have... Uh, working groups of uh, parliamentarians in over 30 countries around Europe, uh, and they come from all the different democratic parties uh, in the parliaments around Europe. And for example, even though this issue may be uh, considered a, a rather left-wing issue, our current uh, president is a is from the centre-right EPP political party. Um, so we, we work with all the main democratic parties. Um, 
Secondly, what are we doing uh, about this issue? One thing is informing uh, our members that this uh, that this issue is a real one. It's not a battle that was sorted out in the 1970s with a vestigial uh, religious movement that's still around. It is a modern, organized, professional, and well-resourced movement that is engaging in, in sophisticated policy and legal strategies. That's one thing that we're explaining. And uh, also, we published a report recently called um, uh, Restoring the Natural Order, where we explain the strategies and the actors of these movements. And, and this uh, this report, we're very busy getting this out to the different national uh, uh, level actors. And also we've been uh, collaborating with, uh, with uh, a French uh, television channel, Arte, in producing a documentary about these, is about these issues and actors so that people understand that, um, that this movement in Europe is real, it's, it's, it's becoming bigger. And, um, and, it's, and if we want to prevent um, politics in Europe from being poisoned about uh, social issues and women's issues and abortion issues uh, the way it is in the United States as we see now, then we need to understand that this is being, that the ground for this is being prepared right now in Europe. You have identified your opponents. What do you make of the criticism of the opponents that they are uh, guilty of low politics, simple misogyny, or a combination of both? What, what do you make of that assessment of your opponents? I would say that's true of some of the opponents. Um, uh, I, I think that there's when one is ready to take away um, the human rights of certain people, of a certain category of people, namely women, sim to me, then, that there is a certain amount of misogyny there, whether you uh, justify it through religious tradition or not. Um, because let's be clear, they're, they, they're advocating for positions where people will have fewer human rights. They're justifying this based on their personal religious convictions, unconcerned about whether the people concerned ha share those same religious convictions. So it's, uh, so I, I think that there's, there's a certain degree of misogyny there. In terms of low tactics, there are populist movements that do this uh, as well. I, I don't see that that's been um, a particular feature of that movement. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, but uh, some features of that movement have been to to circulate false information so that they've developed very well, uh, very thorough narratives on uh, fake medicine. For example, the uh, the, the idea that. Um, uh, that abortion is a health risk, or that um, that it can cause, uh, for example, breast cancer. These are things that they, these are myths that they've that they've uh, put forward. You'll be aware that one of the criticisms against the International Planned Parenthood Federation was that they were very quick to promote abortions in low-income communities in the United States, particularly uh, African American and uh, Hispanic communities, and that one of the one of the pushbacks against the International Planned Parenthood Federation was to say that this was a kind of eugenics program by the back door against these communities. You've heard that. What, what do you make of it? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the eugenic argument has been made quite a bit, and has been, it's, it, that's another common feature about, um, about, uh, about the anti-choice movement in the way that described the, the sexual reproductive health and rights movement. Um, what can I say? It's um, uh, the pro-choice uh, movements and um, in the International Planned Parenthood Federation specifically, their positions are grounded in human rights and the desire to make sure that women are able to exercise the choice, uh, have, have the ability to exercise their choices in life. And so for them it may mean, for some it may mean um, having access to abortion or not, or, or different types of services. Um, these are, it, it's the type of accusation which is almost perfect where you can't actually defend yourself from this it's, um, um, except to go back to your values and say, well, no, this is really, um, uh, this is what we believe in. Alas, I've got another one coming for you as well, Neil. Um, well, if you look at the um, opinions of some of the alt-right conspiracy theorists, they say that the, the reason that they are worried about the scale of abortion in Europe is because of their fears about the declining size of ethnic white European populations around the world. That's why they're interested in, in pushing back against abortion. Abortion rights. Uh, w w what do you make of that? Yeah, well, I mean, at least I prefer this one because at least there they have the, at least they have the courage to own up to their own racism. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the criticism of abortion rights is is um, 
uh, is um, has a racist component to it, but it's covert. At least these alt-right guys who are saying this, they, they own up to their racist attitudes. Um, so the, at least there's that advantage. Uh, yes, I'm aware of that argument, and I, I've heard it's being circulated within um, within alt-right and far-right uh, groups across Europe. Um, they're concerned that uh, uh, the low birth rates of, uh, of white uh, European women uh, will lead to the gradual extinction of the, of the white race. It's, um, uh, they're also concerned that immigration will cause a population replacement in um, in Europe t with uh, darker skinned persons uh, replacing the native white population. I've, I've even heard one about um, a genetic replacement where they're concerned that with the mixture of different uh, races, uh, there will be a genetic admixture as there's more mixed marriages and so that the white population will be subsumed genetically. What can you say about these uh, about these things? It's um, it's true. This is what they say. It's um, this is what they think. It's very ugly, uh, ugly thoughts that they have. On your website, Neil, you argue that it makes sense personally, economically, and, and environmentally for governments to devote development aid to the protection of women's sexual reproductive health and rights. What's the evidence that you cite for that? So the the evidence that we that we base on this is um, demographic studies, uh, uh, demographic and social studies that uh, that have been coming out over the course of many decades. Most recently, uh, um, in a concept known as the demographic dividend, where um, when countries invest in women's rights, in health infrastructure, in education, including in girls' education, and employment opportunities, when they, when they invest in the combination of all of these things, they are able to stabilize their population structures, which then allows for, uh, uh, which then allows for the populations to then uh, increase their, uh, their own national well and better develop as countries and societies. So the, we've seen this, uh, the, the historical examples are, um, are South Korea, which a number of years ago, maybe 50 years ago, was a very, very poor country, but through a series of wise de decisions, where it was able to, de to develop itself into one of the wealthiest and most advanced economies of the world today. Um, and we see this happening with a number of the Asian tigers also over the past uh, over the past couple of years, and basically, unless a country is an oil-rich country, it cannot get out of its underdevelopment trap without going through this so-called demographic uh, transition, and it will have to go through this in order to to become more economically developed. I hear what you say, Neil, but your opponents would point to the fact that Europe's birth rate is declining. We, we see across the Council of Europe area ageing societies. I think the median age now in Greece is 47. We saw in 2015 when, to quote the legend, Angela Merkel opened the floodgates to migrants. We, we need migrants to come in and do the jobs that uh, our own populations won't do. So, they, so your critics would say, how is it possible to be arguing for abortion rights when we're confronted by all these things in Europe. What we should be doing is trying to put in place measures and programs that encourage, that incentivize women to, to have more children. What would you say to that? We should be careful not to draw false parallels. The existence of a law which allows for abortion does not increase the demand for abortion. It simply regulates the conditions in which women will have access to abortion. Where abortion is illegal, women still do abortions, but they are illegal and unsafe, and that results in high rates of maternal deaths. So that the uh, so that the rates of women having abortion around the world, there's not a huge variance whether it's legal or illegal. The one variable that is there is maternal deaths, and that's decided in part by the abortion laws in place. So that's so it's not because. We will restrict abortions so you will have more babies. That's a false parallel. The historical precedents for this are Romania. Ceausescu tried to do this. He wanted many million more Romanians, and so he restricted contraception and abortion. The result of that was a high rate of maternal deaths and lots of, uh, lots of babies left in orphanages. So that's, that's the result of uh, a, a European example of restricting abortions. What do you want lawmakers and governments do to better protect women's sexual reproductive health and rights? Um, there's a lot that they can do. 
First, um, in many countries around Europe, um, access to contraception is still not very good for women. Um, and there's various reasons for that. Um, uh, but common for all these reasons is that the governments should be doing more to make uh, to make access to contraception available. And let's remember, contraception, it's, um, it's not just about preventing unwanted pregnancies. It's about planning it's about planning your life to have the desired number of children that you would like. Um, and there's, there's a lot that can be done. First, governments can be making sure that contraception is reimbursed, that, it is, um, that there's information about different types of contraception. Many, many people will know about the pill and condoms, but there's many, many other options that are available, and different options may be available at different times of life for different women. So that's one thing that they can do. Uh, act proactively take a look at contraception and see what it is that they as a state can be doing. A second one is to take a look at the issue of, of abortion laws. Uh, for many countries, it was sorted out in the 1960s and 70s, and they barely looked at it since. A lot has happened since then, so they should be taking a look to see whether the, the law is updated as, uh, as appropriate. Um, so that's one thing. Maybe another thing is uh, taking a look at the, the specific needs of uh, certain categories of women. Um, the area of sexual reproductive health and rights, it's one where there's, uh, there's a lot of concentrated inequalities for uh, more vulnerable groups. So, uh, so that's one specific area that should be looked at as well. Finally then, Neil, this is a question I ask of all the guests on the Deep Dive podcast. Does the arc of history bend towards progress? I would say overall, yes. On this issue, if we have to take a look at it, uh, um, I would say yes. It, it bends towards progress, but there's sometimes turbulence along the way. And uh, uh, so we need to be aware of that. And it depends how far uh, the depth of time in history that you mean. Uh, and so even though I'm optimistic in the long term, if we're not vigilant in the near term we may suffer some initial setbacks but uh, but i would say yes definitely it, it bends towards progress and on that note neil data thank you very much for your time okay thank you Nigel.